was after I bought my second Hafer, which was a little 14-foot uh, pre-war runabout. It was uh, unusual in that because I knew all of the Hafers at the time only had 45 horsepower, the little 14-footers. But this one had a 50-horse engine. It uh, uh, was actually a Fireball 50, and I uh, didn't know any. I mean, I was really surprised, so I wanted to show it to Glenn. I didn't know him at all and I brought the boat from the from Sioux City up to the lake and as I was and I wanted to show it to my barber who was a big Hafer fan and so I stopped in front of the barber shop and so that he could come out and take a look at it even though I was blocking all the traffic and sure enough another Hafer buff who happened to be working across the street came bounding out of this store and come over and he started, started to talk to me about where did I get the boat and so forth. Well, I also wanted to find Glenn Hafer. I'd never met him at that point. And so they showed me where he, told me where he lived. So I went down, parked in front of his house and I knocked on the door and Glenn came to the door. He was probably, this would have been 1985 and he would have been probably about 80 years old at the time. And he came out and looked at the boat and he said, you know, this boat has never been refinished. There's not a single scratch or flat spot on any of the deck screws at all. And it probably hadn't. It had been stored for a number of years um, by the original owner who had used it on a small oxbow lake called Crystal Lake, which was in South Sioux City, Nebraska. And then it was stored at his plumbing shop for years. And eventually sold to another plumber from Sioux City who stored it for a little bit. Then he decided to put it in the Missouri River of all places. He had not realized that one of the things with a wooden boat that is really important to do, especially one with a single, with only a little strip bottom, no, no double plank bottom, is you need to soak them before you go into the, the boat nearly sank in the Missouri River, and, uh, but he got it out on a trailer and it went back into storage and it eventually ended up in my hands in 1985. But that's how I first met Glenn when I took it over there. Glenn was very open, I mean, it was very friendly, and I remember going into his house that day and he brought out all of his scrapbooks and all that stuff and you know talked about his racing career and all that and and then you know about building their boats and then how many they built and kind of gave me a rough idea unfortunately the Hafers never assigned serial numbers to their boats or anything like that so nobody has an idea of exactly how many of any style boat they ever built. I remember uh, him just kind of bubbling over talking about the history of their company. Uh, it wasn't until a little further on in the discussion that I learned that he, other than helping his dad build, he never really did anything with the design or construction or anything like that once his father passed away. And I thought maybe since boats were finished after that, after his dad's passing in 1957, that he there were boats still being manufactured because I saw some finished, new finished Hafers after that date. And the uh, but it turns out that Glenn never learned the trade of actually fitting the fitting the strips and so forth. I think he basically functioned maybe as a nailer because all the Hafers were all nailed together. Other than the three 19-foot Hafers that were built in 1938 and 1939, um, those were those actually had screws and they were like hacker crafts. They were screwed from the inside of the hull. So there's no screw, there's no plugs on the outside or anything. I probably talked to Glenn probably, uh, I bet probably another dozen times over there. Probably saw him about every year after that until his passing. And he would come to the boat shows occasionally. But he, by the time, by the time he was 80, he was fairly slow in terms of movement and things were a little difficult. So it was best to 
go over to his house to visit. Well, uh, I when I first came upon Hafers, there were a couple of them on our beach when I when I was young, when I was probably in grade school, and so I knew about the boats. I didn't. I knew they were small by comparison to a lot of the other boats that were on the lake, yeah, but. People were died in you know they were died in the wool fans of the boats, and uh, so they were kind of almost soul like in groups. I remember on Spencer Beach, on the west side of the lake, they there must have been seven or eight, and that's just that's a very short section of beach, and so once people somebody bought one, I think everybody else went out and bought them. They were the most reasonable priced inboard you could find around here anyway going 750 bucks or 850 dollars. I have no idea what the last ones were sold for. I mean, I remember there was one completed in 1960 or 61 that was probably the most beautiful 16 foot Hafer 90. It was a Hafer 90 uh, and I think it was a utility as I recall. It was owned by the editor of the owner of the Spencer Daily Reporter newspaper. And it, instead of having the standard white sides, red bottom and red stripe on the side and mahogany deck, it was had the red bottom and red stripe, but it had gray, kind of a medium gray sides. No, I'm, I'm sorry, the stripe was black. Hmm. Medium gray sides, red bottom with a mahogany deck. Unfortunately, the boat, um, the, the daughter was using it uh, for skiing and after they, somebody, got out of the water and the next skier got in when they started up the boat exploded and burned to the water line and sank but it was by far the most beautiful hafer ever so steve headed up the drive to replace the queen with the queen too and that too and that was driven by above the head of the um, Chamber of Commerce here and Steve together and they got it put together and the museum started about that same time and Steve became the, the director of the museum and eventually he became the captain of the Queen when it was delivered and finished and, and he ran many of the excursions of that boat and they recorded his, he had, they had a recorded message as the boat ran around the lake and he would tell histories of this and that and so forth and, and uh, uh, it was fun to hear hear it as it would go by because it was loud enough <laughs> people on the shore could hear hear his uh, description of what people were viewing. I mean he basically was kind of a historian in my mind and uh, unfortunately he died of cancer at a young age and uh, it said that night that was 2002 so he would have been 57 years old and uh, he and I were the same age. Back in the mid 80s Glenn had shown me a picture of the 1939 Hafer that was built. It was slightly different from the 38s. Main thing really was it had a little engine with more horsepower. It had a Mercury V8, a uh, Scripps conversion on a Mercury V8. And the boat was delivered, and I unfortunately I forgot to look up the lake, but it was delivered to a lake that's out by Gillette, Wyoming. And that's where it spent its early years. So I decided I was going to track it down and I had the name of the um, uh, the name of the original owner and so I just started calling around and I mean I looked up name on the phone book or I mean I called information and and I found one name that matched and I called out there and it was a pharmacist and he said no I was not related to them at all but I knew the I was the son, uh, I am the son of the owner of the original marina that was on that lake. And he says, I remember that boat very well. It was a beautiful boat. It'd go really fast. But 
I remember we had to retrieve it from the bottom of the lake one time because they had a tendency to nosedive when you cut the speed quickly. They would nose under. And uh, and I and I said, well, that, you know, that, this was before I had mine, but when I got mine, I found they have a great big air tank underneath the front deck that I think was to try to give them a little buoyancy <laughs> if necessary. <laughs> but they said they fished that boat out of the lake, and but he knew the family had moved from the Gillette area up to Billings, Montana. But. I ran into a dead end. This would have been 86, 1986 or 87. Well, probably it was, it was after Jerry Deercup's death, but probably it might have been 2005 or 6. His son called me and said he'd gotten a call from somebody in Montana and claimed they had a heifer. And I said, Stephen, I said, that boat has got to be the 39 Hafer that went out to Gillette. So I, he had the phone number and name and so I called out there and sure enough that was the boat. He'd found it on a farm somewhere, in, on, somewhere around Helena, Montana and he brought it home. He told me he was taking it to a restorer in the state of Washington and I don't know whatever happened to it. So. Cool. But that boat still exists, so at least two of the three 19. 19s are still in existence. So we know that the maximum production was probably in 47 and 48. There was such a pent-up demand for boats after the war that I, I remember Glenn told me they built about 12 boats each of those years. But after that, I think production was maybe three or four at the most. So I'm, they built from 47 on, so I'm guessing that maybe they might have built 40, between 40 and 50 of the 16 footers. They pre-war, they, I think they built the small 14 footers from probably 34 or 35 on to the beginning of the war. When Glenn left Spirit Lake to go to work at the Martin Bomber plant in Omaha, uh, they, he told me there were still four hull, unfinished hulls. Uh, I was able to, do, going back to telling the story about my the little 14-footer I acquired with the 450 in it, Fireball 450, Glenn said, because uh, I had tracked it down, the motor was completed and late, was finished by Gray in late 41. And he said, Dad was having all kinds of trouble getting motors at that time. And he said, that one must have come up. And he just grabbed it. And because the boat, we think, was sold in 1942 to the plumber in South Sioux City. Um, the, uh, but my guess is there probably were less than 20 of those boats built. Um, the original one is still around. It was powered with an Arnold Seamite, which was about a 20 horsepower engine. And John determined that was not going to work. So they switched to a Red Wing, which was also about a 20 horsepower. And that didn't work very well either. That's when they switched to the gray 445s and they built all the rest of them. I believe the Arnold Seamite is still in existence. I know that. Uh, I think the people that had the Kansas Breeze, that boat is still around here somewhere. I don't know who owns it, but it was the last boat finished by John Hafer in 1955. It belongs, it belonged to a family from Topeka, Kansas, and uh, that's how it got the name Kansas Breeze. <laughs> it was a Hafer 90. Uh, I know that they that. At the time, well, at the last time I heard it, the engine was gone. It was not gone, but it had been. It was in need of an overhaul or something mm -hmm. like that. But it's. I've been told it's still around here somewhere. Just needs to be found. <laughs> so. <laughs> That's right.